Dearest friends, we have come to a part of Agdabuha's life which was of great difficulty for the Master and was really very sad. So a lot of what we are going to look at together this evening unfortunately is going to be concerned with the effects of covenant breaking. But perhaps as we follow the life of Abdu'l-Bahá, we become closer to the Master as we try to come close to so many of the experiences that he had. Now, yesterday, we turned our attention to the beginnings of the faith in the West and also its development in Ishkobot. But we must return to Akka and the events there. Mirza Muhammad Ali, as you remember, the greater branch, the one just next to Abdu'l-Bahá, who was the most great branch, arranged to send Mirza Marjidin to the Turkish governor general in Damascus to seek his assistance. And Marjidin did all he could to acquaint the governor fully with the construction work on Mount Carmel, with the coming and going of American believers, and with the gatherings the master always held for the friends in Akka. And a few days after Marcy Din's return, a telegram in code was received from Turkey with orders from Sultan Abdul Hamid. It was on August 20, 1901, that Abdul Baha was informed by the governor of Akka of the Sultan's orders that the restrictions which were being gradually relaxed should be reimposed, and that Abdul Baha and his brothers should be strictly confined within the walls of the city of Akka. And the Sultan's orders were at first rigidly enforced and the freedom of the exiled community was severely curtailed. Abdul Baha had to submit to prolonged interrogation by judges and officials in government house at Akka. And this went on for several consecutive days. And one of the first things the master did at that time was to intercede on behalf of his brothers. But their hostility and activities against him had not been lessened by this last step of the Turkish sovereign, which quite possibly they had not been expecting, that they also should be under this reinforced ban. Abdu'l-Waha did, ex- did succeed through intervention with the civil and military authorities in obtaining the freedom of his followers who lived in Akka so that they could continue to earn their means of livelihood. And the covenant breakers continued their activities. On various occasions, they approached the governor general of Damascus, who was overseeing the whole of that area, the Mufti of Beirut, members of the Protestant missions established in Syria and in Akka, and even an influential sheikh in Constantinople, and urged them to assist their objective, which was to bring about Abdu'l-Bahá's execution or to see him deported to some far-off place. Now, to some of these people, the covenant breakers portrayed Abdu'l-Bahá as a callous usurper who had trampled on their rights, robbed them of their heritage, reduced them to poverty, made their friends in Persia their enemies, accumulated for himself a vast fortune, and acquired no less than two-thirds. To others, they declared that Abdu'l-Bahá contemplated making of Akka and Haifa 
a new Mecca and Medina, that he was claiming to be the Son of God and the return of Jesus Christ. They also accused him of meditating a rebellion against the Sultan, of already having hoisted the banner of Yabaha al Abha, which they said was the ensign of revolt, in distant villages in Palestine and Syria, of having raised an army of 30,000 men, of being engaged in the construction of a fortress and a vast ammunition depot on Mount Carmel, of having secured the moral and material support of a host of English and American friends, amongst whom were officers of foreign powers who were arriving in large numbers and in disguise to pay homage to Abdul Baha. The list went on endlessly, and you can see how these different approaches were designed for the different people. It ended with their accusation that Abdul Baha was making a bid ultimately to seize the power wielded by the Sultan himself. And they got these documents signed by false witnesses in Akka and dispatched them through their own agents to Constantinople. By now it was the year 1904. The Covenant Breakers worked with the sure hope that the Sultan would be alarmed and take measures to destroy Abdul Baha. A commission of inquiry duly arrived in Akka, dispatched by the Sultan. Spies were planted around the house of Abdul Baha. The Baha'is in Akka were made to feel that their presence was not required. To make things easier for them, Abdul Baha decided that they should temporarily leave. Many of them needed financial support to go away, even for a short period. And Abdul Baha himself borrowed a large sum of money from an American in Paris so that they could move to Egypt. Some 70 of them went. Abdul Baha drastically reduced the number of pilgrims. Then, for a time, he stopped their visits altogether. The commission summoned Abdul Baha to answer the accusations. And once again, we turn to Mr. Baluzi to pages 113 and 114 of his book, Abdul Baha. Abdul Waha met the members of the commission several times. In no uncertain terms, he told them that the charges preferred were patently threadbare, that the writings of Baha'u'llah, which were shown to them, made it inconceivable that he, the son of Baha'u'llah and his successor, could ever be implicated in any nefarious design to overthrow the Ottoman rule that he was ready to meet any insult, any injury, any harm which they might devise to inflict upon him. Mirza Muhammad Ali, a superb calligraphist of the first rank, had written the emblem, Ya Baha'u'l Abha, on a piece of cloth, and had sent it to the authorities with the statement that this was the standard which Abdu Baha had contrived. It was also alleged that two others had hoisted this standard in Galilee to invite support, and furthermore, that Sheikh Mahmud of Akka had gone with it among the Bedouin beyond Jordan to incite them to revolt. To this charge, Abdul Baha observed that it was miraculous that a standard so prominently displayed had not been noticed by the numerous agents of the Governor-General. 
Another charge against Abdu'l-Bahá, this vast tract of land he had acquired to serve as the base for the kingdom that he was going to set up. It would be nothing short of a miracle, Abdu'l-Bahá replied, if he, a prisoner of the Turkish Empire, who was kept under surveillance, whose movements were closely watched and scrutinized, had succeeded in establishing a base for any kingdom. In any case, he was willing to sell all these huge acres for only 2,000 pounds. All the charges were demolished. Then the commission asked for what reason the Americans came to Akka. Abdul Baha replied that they came to visit the shrine of Baha'u'llah and to learn of spiritual matters. The commission then asked what Abdul Baha had to say to the charge that he had distributed seditious literature seen to be in his possession. Such material, he answered, had not been in his possession and could not have been. The commission had coaxed, bribed or forced a number of people to come and give evidence to the contrary. Now these witnesses were mentioned. At that, Abdu'l-Bahá rose up, majestic and commanding, declared emphatically that no seditious literature had ever been in his position, and walked out of the room unhindered. Thereafter, the whole inquiry collapsed. The years 1905 and 1906 were relatively free from pressures. Pilgrims and resident Baha'is all found the situation in Acre more relaxed. But the situation in the Middle East itself became more complex and more tense. And Sultan Abdul Hamid became frightened at the new political thinking in the area. And the covenant breakers felt it was too good an opportunity to miss. They tried again. In the winter of 1907, a commission of four arrived post haste from Istanbul and they brought with them the papers the other commission had found unsubstantiated and had discarded. The first thing that commission did was to dismiss all officials, including the governor of Akka, who were regarded as friendly to Abdu'l-Bahá. Both the post and the telegraph were placed under strict scrutiny, and Ignoring that time-honored overlordship of the Governor-General of Damascus, they established direct communication with the ministers of the Sultan in Istanbul. Spies were once again placed around Abdul Baha's house. People were kept away. And even the poor of Akka didn't dare to come on Fridays to receive the alms which meant so much to them in their poverty-stricken lives. Rumors circulated that Abdu'l-Bahá was to be forcibly taken to Tripoli, to the vast desert there, cut off from the rest of the world. But the inhabitants of Akka were amazed to see Abdu'l-Bahá completely indifferent to the presence of the Commission of Inquiry. He attended to the repairs of his house, which he rented. The agent of the landlord was puzzled, not understanding why all that care and expense should be put into a property when before long Abdul Wahab would be leaving for good. Abdul Wahab was found one day planting a tree for whom do you plant this tree? he was asked. Those who preceded us planted, and we have enjoyed the fruit, was the reply. It is our duty to do the same, to benefit those who come after us. The people of Akka 
were even more astonished that Abdul Baha was buying and storing fuel for the winter. Now we turn again to Mr. Baluzi for something which is so familiar to us. But now we have it in situ, as it were. Because a few days before the arrival of the Commission of Enquiry, Abdul Baha had had a dream, which he told to the Baha'is. He dreamt that a ship sailed into the Bay of Haifa, and birds resembling dynamite flew inland from it. The people of Akko were terrified, and he stood among them, calm and collected, watching these birds. They circled and circled over the town, and then went back, whence they had come. There was no explosion. Abdul Baha said that danger loomed, but it would pass, and no harm would result. Abdul Baha absolutely refused to call on this commission knowing that if he did so and was acquitted of the charges, it would be said that he had bribed his way out of trouble. We should turn again <laughs> to this really so happy little book, where Mr. Baluzi recounts that one night a man drove from Haifa to Acre in a covered carriage. He was an Italian, who acted as consul for Spain. Members of his family had an agency for an Italian steamship company. Taking great care not to be noticed and recognized, he managed to reach the house of Abdul Baha and asked to meet him immediately. In the bay was an Italian cargo boat, which this man, in his great love and regard for Abdul Baha, had kept waiting moving it from one end of the bay to the other to avert suspicion. And now he had come to offer Abdul Baha a safe passage to any port he might desire. Time was running out. Abdul Baha asked five of the Baha'is to consult and give him their opinion. They unanimously resolved to request Abdul Baha to accept the consul's offer. But his response was, the Bab did not run away, and I shall not run away. In the meantime, the Commission of Enquiry was receiving evidence and being bombarded with cables from Abdul Hamid. They also visited the mausoleum on Mount Carmel, which was nearing completion. It was, it is, a very solid building. It had to be to serve its purpose. But the Commission ignored that purpose. There were vaults under the building, a fact they considered to be very significant as they had been told that Abdul Baha was constructing a fortress. Soon after this visit, they boarded the boat which had brought them from Constantinople and now lay anchored off Arca. The sun was westering. The boat turned towards Arca. The whole populace of the two cities could see it set on this menacing course. They believed that Abdul Baha was to be arrested and taken on board. They were convinced that he would be transported to Fitzan, to Tripoli, or to some other remote and dreary region where he would surely perish. The family of Abdul Baha and other Baha'is were in despair. But Abdul Baha was calm and serene, walking all alone in the courtyard of his house. Here and there, at vantage points along the shores of Akka, anxious Baha'is were watching the movement of that boat. The sun sank in the Mediterranean, and the boat kept its course. 
it came very close to Arca. But then, all of a sudden, changed direction and made for the open sea. In an instant, the danger had vanished. Abdu'l-Bahar was safe. When the news was brought to him after dusk had fallen, and he was still calmly walking in his courtyard, with radiant acquiescence. And just after the departure of that boat, there came news from Istanbul that Abdul Hamid had narrowly escaped death. A bomb meant for him had exploded, killing and injuring others. And now we come to the fate of the Sultan Abdul Hamid. Because there was an uprising, which everybody knows as the Young Turk Revolution. Abdul Hamid knew that the days of his despotism were numbered. He had no alternative but to submit. And the Central Committee issued a declaration on July 23, 1908, demanding the restitution of the Constitution, which had been dead for 30 years, and they wanted it back within 24 hours. The Sultan was told in no uncertain terms that should he fail to comply with the committee's demands, the Second and Third Army Corps would bring him down. They were ready and poised for action. The next day, the Constitution was given back to the people. And all the political and religious prisoners of Abdul Hamid were set free. But notwithstanding, such were the fears and opposition engendered in Akka that officials sent a cable to Constantinople inquiring whether Abdu'l-Bahá II was to be given his liberty. They were instructed to set him free. Abdul Hamid was anxious to safeguard his position now as a constitutional monarch. But within nine months, he fell into the trap of a counter-revolution. On April 13th, 1909, troops mutinied in Istanbul, and the young Turks were overthrown. But within a week, the Arab general, Mohammed Shokat Pasha, arrived with troops from Salonika, and within a fortnight, Abdul Hamid was dispersed. He died nine years later, and all those years, he was under close surveillance. Abdul Baha was free. He was 64 years old. But what happened to the members of the Commission of Inquiry? Arif Bey, who had headed the Commission, was shot by a sentry. Two others also perished, and the fourth, Adham Bey, fled to Egypt. One day, that man presented himself at the business house of Haji Mirza Hassani Khurasani in Alexandria. His servant had stolen all that he had, and he could not even take himself to Cairo. He was given a small sum of money. And when Abdu'l-Bahá Abdu heard about it, he sent Adham Bey ten pounds. It was during those years, at intervals, that Abdul Baha wrote his will and testament. It is written in three parts, and in the middle of part two, it says something that now becomes more real to us. Oh, dearly beloved friends, I am now in very great danger, and the hope of even an hour's life is lost to me. I am thus constrained to write these lines for the protection of the cause of God, 
the preservation of his law, and the safeguarding of his word, and the safety of his teachings. By the ancient beauty, this wronged one hath in no wise borne, nor doth he bear, a grudge against any one. Towards none doth he entertain any ill feeling, and uttereth not one word save for the good of the world. My supreme obligation, however, of necessity prompteth me to guard and preserve the cause of God. Thus, with the greatest regret, I counsel you, saying, Guard ye the cause of God, protect his law, and have the utmost fear of discord. This is the foundation of the belief of the people of Baha. May my life be offered up for them. His Holiness the Exalted One, the Bab, is the manifestation of the unity and oneness of God and the forerunner of the ancient beauty. His Holiness the Abha Beauty, may my life be a sacrifice for his steadfast friends, is the supreme manifestation of God and the dayspring of his most divine essence. All others are his servants and do his bidding. Unto the most holy book every one must turn, and all that is not expressly recorded therein must be referred to the Universal House of Justice. That which this body, whether unanimously or by majority, doth carry, that is verily the truth and the purpose of God himself. Whoso doth deviate therefrom is verily of them that love discord, hath shown forth malice and turned away from the Lord of the Covenant. By this house is meant the universal house of justice, which is to be elected from all countries, that is, from those parts in the east and west where the loved ones are to be found. After such manner of the customary elections in western countries, such as those of England. So at that very time of all that danger, Abdul Baha was securing the faith for the future and the election of the Universal House of Justice. On March 21st, 1909, one, one month before the fall of Abdul Hamid, Abdul Baha placed the remains of the Bab in a central vault beneath the mausoleum, which was completed and ready to receive them. The shrine of the Bab at that time was not as it is today. Then it was a rectangular building of six rooms. The beloved guardian had the mountain at the back blasted away. He added three more rooms and made the building square. And it was the superstructure of that building that was designed by the hand of the cause of God, Sutherland Maxwell, the father of Amrita Baha Rukia Khanum. Shoghi Effendi had that beautiful marble superstructure with the golden dome, built over Abdul Baha's original six-roomed structure. And as you circumambulate the shrine of the Bab and pass beneath the arches and round, then you are walking around the part of the structure which Abdul Baha had built. When he, when the master had put the remains of the Bab into the mausoleum, he wrote to the Baha'is, the most joyful tidings is this, that the holy, the luminous body of the Bab, after having for 60 years been transferred from place to place by reason of the ascendancy of the enemy and from fear of the malevolent, and having known neither rest nor tranquillity, has, through the mercy of the Abha beauty, been ceremoniously deposited on this day of Nowruz within the sacred casket in the exalted shrine 
on Mount Carmel. By a strange coincidence, on that same day of Nowruz, a cablegram was received from Chicago announcing that the believers in each of the American centers had elected a delegate and sent to that city, to Chicago, and definitely decided on the site and construction of the Mashrafal Ashka. That was the good news that Abdu'l-Baha sent to the friends. But it had taken Abdu'l-Baha ten years to complete the building of the shrine. At every step, there was opposition, engineered mainly by Mirza Muhammad Ali and his associates. A German businessman who was resident in Haifa and was negotiating for the land on behalf of Abdul Baha was forced to take the case back to him, asking bluntly, how could he bring the deal to a satisfactory conclusion when Abdu Baha's own brother provided the stumbling block? And when at last the owner of the land agreed to sell it at a reasonable price, the covenant breakers got a number of people to petition the government and lay claim to ownership of the land. And Abdu Baha took Dr. Kairula with him for the laying of the foundation stone. Dr. Kairula subsequently became a covenant breaker in America. Then there was endless difficulty in getting an access road laid down, but the work went steadily on during the years of peril. And so, as we know, on the morning of March the 21st, 1909, the day of Nowruz, Abdu'l-Baha had the Marga marble sarcophagus, which was a gift of the Baha'is of Rangoon, carried up the mountain and placed in the vault. And it was that same evening, in the presence of Baha'is from the east and the west, that Abdu'l-Baha laid in the sarcophagus the wooden casket that contained the inseparable remains of the Bab and the disciple who had died with him. The Bab had been cruelly maligned, cruelly wronged, and cruelly put to death. As Abdu'l-Baha said, his torn and smashed body had had no home for sixty-five years. But now the heart of Carmel received it. And there is a prophecy in the Bible, in the book of Zechariah. You will find it in chapter 6, verse 12, that was fulfilled that day. It says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. The branch had built the temple of the Lord, had raised his tabernacle on his mountain, on Carmel, the mountain of God. After laying to rest the remains of the Bob, Abdul Baha chose to live in Haifa, where a house was being built for him. And soon the time came when he ceased even to set foot within the city gates of Arca. He had been 24 years old when he arrived there and, you remember, was put in irons by the God. He was 65 years old when he was finally released from the shackles of that town. He had little time now for rest, for he himself would take the faith of Baha'u'llah to the West. The year was 1910. The time was late August, and Abdul Waha was at home in Haifa. That afternoon, he visited the home of one of the Persian Baha'is and also saw some of the pilgrims there. Then he went by carriage to the holy tomb of the Bab 
as he had so often done. And then he went straight to the harbour and boarded a steamer that would take him to Egypt. The master was 66 years old. He had lived for 42 years in the Holy Land, 40 of them as a prisoner. Now he had gone. For the friends, it was entirely unexpected. There were no formalities, no tearful goodbyes. Abdu'l-Bahá's travels had begun. That would bring him to Europe, take him back to Egypt for a much-needed rest, then onwards, westwards again to the United States and Canada, back to Europe and again to Egypt and eventually back to the Holy Land. And when the boat arrived at Haifa early in the afternoon of December 5th, 1913, Abdu'l-Bahá sent his attendants ashore, told them not to let the Baha'is come to the landing stage and himself disembarked at nightfall. He had been away three years and three months. With all his strength and energy, Abdu'l-Bahá had raised the call of Baha'u'lláh in England, Scotland, France, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, and Hungary. His travels in North America had taken him to Canada, as well as from coast to coast and back again in the United States. And it was in North America particularly that he had raised an urgent call for peace, urging again and again that steps be taken to raise the banner of international peace before it was too late. And I thought you might like to have the session closed with the story of Mrs. White. Mrs. White was the wife of a Presbyterian minister in Scotland. And it was to the Reverend and Mrs. White that Abdu'l-Bahá went when he visited Scotland in 1913. And there's a very special story and something very special about Mrs. White. And here it is, I hope. Here we are. Mrs. White uh, wrote this account for the fourth volume of the Baha'i World. So if you like to find exactly, there you will find it. And this is what she said. After retiring from his chair in Edinburgh University, Sir Alexander Simpson and my only sister Margot wintered in Egypt, 1905-6, and invited me and my friend, Mrs. Thornbrook Cropper, to join them. Now, Mrs. Cropper had an invitation to visit Abbas Effendi. You remember, she went along with Mrs. Phoebe Hurst, afterwards known as Abdul Baha, the leader of the Baha'i movement, then a prisoner under the Turkish government in the Fort of Akka. And I was included in the invitation. Knowing of this possibility when in Cambridge some months before, I consulted Professor E. Granville Brown as to the proposed visit. And his answer was, certainly, do not refuse so great an opportunity. So it came that I spent two days in the prison home of Abdu'l-Bahá. During the visit to the tomb of Baha'u'lláh, the figure of a boy was kneeling in rapt adoration, and the thought passed through my mind, what destiny lies before this boy? He was then seven years old. It was Shoghi Effendi, who, by his grandfather's will, has been, at the age of 24, 
made leader of the movement. Here let me include that I wrote of my visit in March 1906. High in a seagirt fortress overlooking the Bay of Acre, in the prison home of Abbas Effendi, the outlook at early dawn would awaken the dullest mind. From the tower came the sounds of the Archon, the call to prayer, and from the fort, the Turkish soldiers' revalley. Round the rocks, which form the natural foundation of the house, break in unceasing roar the waves of the sea, over which have come crusaders and armies innumerable. As the mind's eye flashes back over history, it sees fleet after fleet, army after army, all led by the chivalry of Europe. Dandola, St. Louis, Richard Coeur de Leon, the very flower of Christendom, as it then understood itself. It recalls the passionate warfare of centuries, during which cross and crescent fought and the deadliest antagonism existed between Muslim and Christian. Is it a small thing in the sight of the angels that a spirit is here which would shelter all nations and inspires its followers to use every power and willingly shed their blood to reconcile these warring elements and spread the truth? that God, who has spoken by all his prophets, has in these last times spoken among the Persians, giving them a light which is leading them out into truth, freedom, love, so that they too, Muslims, use Christ's gospel as their own and only long that all who name his name be worthy of it. The pilgrim to Acre is asked many questions on his return. Is this a prophet? A manifestation of divinity? In seeking an answer, we must remember how easily, how constantly the East has ever used these names. And we must ask ourselves, what do we recognize as divine? Is it enough of divinity to see love made perfect through suffering a lifelong patience, a faith which no exile or imprisonment can dim, a love which no treachery can alter, a hope which rises a pure clear flame after being drenched by the world's indifference through a lifetime. If that is not divinity enough for this world, What is? There is no magic here. A material world today is too fond of seeking after magic. No magic, but the old magic of faith, hope, and love. Or, you ask, is this a progressive movement? A step forward in the history of the world? Surely there can be no question as to the answer, for what do we find here? In the heart of a Turkish country, and at the centre of Mohammedan power, that most conservative cast iron of systems, conserved in a faith which is passionate, fierce, fanatical to the death, there to find preached freedom, education at all costs, absolute equality of men and women, the frank recognition of the value of Christian truth, the teaching that God has revealed himself in all faiths, the love of God and the brotherhood of all nations. What greater sign can you ask than the power to flood this old world with love and inspiration with patience and courage. Where formerly, after a foreigner had sat at the table and used the cups, they must be broken. So great was the sense of contamination. Now all are lovingly welcomed. 
Everything is shared with love, warm, kindly, sympathetic love. And without money or price. Ah, that the Western world will understand if it understands nothing else. Without money and without price. Without backsheets. The curse of the East. Not the meanest servant would touch the pilgrim's money. Is that divine enough for our cold western hearts who understand not the East with its mystical longing, its patient, age-long brooding over the mystery of life? And then she quotes a paraphrase of a poem of Matthew Arnold. The Roman legions thundered by. She plunged and fought again. O east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. Not in Kipling's way will they meet, not in fleets and ironclads and armies, not in the sergeant drilling Pharaoh's army. No, but where the tides of faith rise, where love to God and service to man are flowing like a river, There they meet and understand. And the deeper the understanding, perhaps the more silent it is. After the visit to the tombs, the pilgrim will visit Baji, the garden where Baha'u'llah spent his days when the Turkish authorities gave him some relaxation of his prison rules. As he crosses the fields in spring, the pilgrim's feet will be hidden by the red anemones, and to the excited imagination of the devout, their brilliant color seems a symbol at once of the red page of martyrdom so keenly desired, so gladly secured by the martyrs of Sheikh Tabasi, of Zanjan, and of Yazd whose blood and passion has awakened to life thousands of sleeping hearts in Persia, and also of the glowing heart of love to God, which shall yet unite east and west in one red flame. However you look at this movement or appraise its value, remember one thing. It is not centuries ago. It is today. It is a living, growing, vital force now and may hold within itself the power to alter the destinies of millions of human beings. It has come at a time when conditions are entirely new, when conditions in interchange, communication are universal, immediate, both on material and probably also on the psychic plane. Him they gladly call Master had said that soon meetings will be held in Tehran, in Washington, St. Petersburg and London, all moved at one time by one spirit. Circumstances arose which obliged Mrs. Thornbrook Cropper and myself to leave Acre suddenly. His life as a prisoner of the Sultan was in continual danger by any sudden pressure from Constantinople. And at that time, it was not considered wise that visitors from the West should be too much in evidence. So it came that we could not have the farewell conversation we had promised ourselves. Instead, I left a letter for him. In due time, an answer came. And you know what was in that letter from Abdul Baha? The master wrote of things. And then he said, Behold how its light, the light of these candles, is now burning upon the world's darkened horizon. The first candle is the candle of unity in the political realm, the early glimmerings of which can now be discerned. The second candle is unity of thought in world undertakings, the consummation of which will ere long be witnessed. 
The third candle is unity and freedom, which will surely come to pass. The fourth candle is unity in religion, which is the cornerstone of the foundation itself, and which, by the power of God, will be revealed in all its splendor. The fifth candle is the unity of nations, a unity which in this century will be securely established, causing all the peoples of the world to regard themselves as citizens of one common fatherland. The sixth candle is the unity of races, making of all that dwell on earth peoples of one kindred and one race. The seventh candle is unity of language, that is, the choice of a universal tongue in which all peoples will be instructed and converse. Each and every one of these will inevitably come to pass inasmuch as the power of the kingdom of God will aid and assist in their realization. The Tablet with the Candles of Unity was written to Mrs. White, the wife of a Scottish Presbyterian minister.